Each Sunday morning we have a program that's provided for our children called the Jam Program. And we are inviting our children to come forward right now, if they will, if they're ages 3 to 3rd grade. And uh, they'll be participating in that class right now. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And yes, he does love the little children, does he not? Amen. Amen. In order to understand any one of the books of the New Testament or the Old Testament, it's important to understand why it was written and what you're supposed to do with it. And it's uh, amazing for me that the Apostle Peter gave us both those pieces of information as he wrote 1 Peter. Uh, as he wrote the epistle to tell and prepare the disciples for suffering, he offered up 34 imperatives as to what to do about that suffering. Uh, there are four things, kind of like a preparation list. And so each chapter of the book of First Peter, and for that matter, Second Peter, makes reference to the suffering and then follows it by telling us what to do about it. First Peter 4 and verse 12, Paul writes, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery a trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rather, he says, rejoice in that you share that you share in Christ's sufferings. And he goes on to say in verses fourteen through sixteen, and if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer uh, as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but rather let him glorify God in that name. Paul, or Peter then offers up throughout his epistles uh, five imperatives of how you and I might uh, handle this. Understand, first of all, that the suffering he's talking about isn't suffering that's brought about by your or my bad choices. It's hard times, it's difficult, it's grief that's brought on by what Satan does in the world, by what evildoers do in the world to us, and by the circumstances of life that bring grief and suffering to us. Notice he says in the midst of this text, don't let any of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Don't cause the suffering. But rather, when you suffer, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, if you suffer because you are a Christian, you should glorify God as a result of that. Interestingly, he says, you are blessed. That's what he said in the previous verse. He says, rejoice, because you are blessed when that happens to you. So then let's consider five imperatives, if you will, five things in chapter 4 of 1 Peter that Peter brings out that are designed to help prepare us for the promised suffering. The first of those things, he says, interestingly enough, is that Christians won't drink alcohol. If you look with me, if you will, to verses 2 through uh, 7. Peter offers up three reasons uh, in 1 Peter 4 as to why Christians will not drink. The first of those is listed in verses 2 and 3. When he says, Live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer in human passions, but rather for the will of God. For the time past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want you to do. 
living in sensuality and passions and drunkenness, orgies and drinking parties and lawlessness. He says, you and I should not be living for our human passions, he says. Live the rest of your time no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. But in the list of those things that he says we'll not do, he says we'll not participate in drunkenness, orgies, which is nothing more than uh, a uh, promiscuous parties that involve alcohol, and then drinking parties themselves. He says Christians don't get involved in drinking uh, gatherings. And then finally he says lawless, lawlessness. These things are counterproductive. In fact, they cause suffering. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But the second thing he says in these few verses, in verse 4 he says, in this regard, they're surprised, talking about the Gentiles who want us to get drunk with them. He says, they're surprised when you do not join with them in the same overflow of corruption. And they ridicule you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So much of the consumption of alcohol is peer pressure based. What's ironic is, is why on earth would I want to do what those who are going to hell would encourage me to do? There is a reason why their souls are lost. And there is a reason why they would want to peer pressure me into it. Notice the ways in which he says they do it. For it's not just children and teenagers that are subject to peer pressure. Notice what he says. They're surprised when you not join with them in the same overflow of corruption, and they ridicule you for it. They make fun of you. There's the peer pressure right there. Our society says, no, nah, it's okay. You can go ahead and drink alcohol. And they think you're silly for thinking you shouldn't. It may be that there are those in the auditorium this morning that think it's fruitless and silly for me to talk about how that you and I should not be drinking alcohol. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. But then thirdly, in offering up reasons for why we would remain sober, he says, because the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, he says, you be self-controlled and be sober Sober-minded, underscore the thought of being sober. Those who get drunk are lost and lose their souls because they are no longer, no longer sober. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul writes, The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is the simple truth of the matter. Those who are unrighteous will not go to heaven. And then he says this, don't be deceived. Adulterers, homosexuals, and those who get drunk will not inherit the kingdom of God. Interesting list of people. Two out of those three people, we would readily condemn and say, no, I would never do that. Adultery, homosexuality, but in the list, my friend, is those who get drunk and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5 echoes the same thought when he says the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, drunkenness, and things like these, I'm warning you, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Bible is pretty clear on this. That getting drunk, first of all, is counterproductive to overcoming the suffering that's being brought into your world. Secondly, it makes the case that getting drunk will cost you your souls. If you and I drink alcohol in such a way that we are intoxicated, we will lose our souls. That is what's at risk. Now, as you consider the rest I have to say, understand there is a point of demarcation. There is a moment in which you were saved, but now you're lost, and alcohol can be a part of that moment. So what is drunkenness? What is drunkenness according to the Bible? Well, here's some things it says. Isaiah 28 and verse 7 says, These reel with wine, and they stagger with strong drink. They err in visions, and they stumble in judgment. For all their tables are full of vomit and filthiness. Now there's a picture that's painted of the fun life of alcohol. You can go out and have a fun time of alcohol, and then puke it out onto the table, then you get too much of it. Drunkenness. Notice he says that they err in vision. They don't see well. That's the reason why drinking and driving doesn't go well. Because you don't see the car that's pulling out in front of you or about to T-bone or the child that steps off the curb that you didn't see because you were too drunk and erring in your vision. And in your judgment. The first thing that happens to a person when they take alcohol is their inhibitions are removed and their ability to make sound judgments are clouded. But then also, Proverbs 23 and verse 29. Look not upon the wine when it is in the cup, when it's red and when it sparkles in the cup. It bites like a snake and stings like a viper. Your eyes will behold strange things. Your heart will speak perverse things. And again, we're back to the, the uh, inebriation, 
that it causes. And one might say, well, that's just, that's talking about getting straight up drunk. My friends, I lived, I grew up in a household of alcoholics. My grandfather was a bona fide alcoholic the day he died. Two of my brothers, alcoholics, one of them killed themselves over alcoholism. I grew up in a household where the Friday, Saturday parties were an every week thing, with scores and scores of people getting drunk. In various stages of it, you understand, because that's the way it went. I've seen firsthand as a child what alcohol can do to a family and to a home. But in regard to this, you're still saying to yourself, well, Cliff, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm just going to drink one or two. In which case, I'm not getting drunk. Well, according to the American Medical Association, as well as the state laws of Texas and every other state in our country, there are some rules about what determines what drunkenness is. You know, you can actually know it, both biblically and both medically and legally. You can know exactly what drunkenness is. According to the American Medical Association, one drink will bring a person's blood alcohol level to 0.05% milliliters per deciliter. A 120-pound person on average, if they were to drink one drink, one glass of wine, one shot of whiskey, one can of beer, they will be at 0.05%. And that, by law, is not drunken. It's not inebriated. It's not intoxicated. However, the second drink would bring you to 0.10. And according to the medical, American Medical Association, as well as virtually every state in our country, a 0.08 blood alcohol is constituting drunkenness, which means the second beer, the second glass of wine, the second shot of whiskey constitutes being drunk and therefore well on your way to hell. And so one might argue, I can have one, and still not be technically drunk. Well, that's true. It just means you're halfway to hell. And if a person's ready to live their life on that kind of a premise to see just how close I can get to hell without actually bouncing through the front door, then listen to the American Medical Association and understand the first drink doesn't make you a drunk, but the second one does. State laws, the same way. You get pulled over by a state trooper and you blow a blood alcohol of .08, that's two beers. And as a paramedic, I can't tell you how many people who could not even stand up straight, that when I asked them, how much have you had to drink tonight, sir, they would say, I had two beers. And I'm thinking, boy, this really worked on you, didn't it, two beers? Well, first of all, they were lying because it, it slurred their judgment as well as their speech. But, but the second thing is, is it doesn't matter, even if they're telling the truth. All I have is two beers. That's intoxicated. Doesn't matter that their speech is slurred. If they blow a .08, they will go to jail for DWI because by state law, that is in fact intoxication. National statistics say that there is one death every 45 seconds on our U.S. highways as a result of buzzed driving. Two beers. 45 deaths every minute for that which some would try and defend to say is their right to do, to drink alcohol. Alcohol itself is condemned in the Bible by God as being evil in and of its nature. First of all, in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 21, Isaiah writes, Woe unto those that are wise in their own eyes, and here's how they're wise in their own eyes. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. They can do it and still stay on their feet. Woe to those that are mighty in mixing strong drink. Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. But let's move on from that, because that's not the only imperative that Peter gives on being able to sustain ourselves in the midst of suffering brought on by the world. The second thing he brings up is again in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 8 as we continue. Above all things he says, Be fervent in your love among yourselves, since love covers a multitude of sins, and show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so the second thing we would do that is an imperative for preparing for suffering and hard times that would come upon us is that we would learn to love one another. And watch this, he says, fervently. To do it fervently, with enthusiasm, that we should love one another. 
since love covers a multitude of sins, to love one another. What is it to love one another? If I'm doing this, if I'm doing what he's saying here, what does it look like? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul lists off what are the attributes of love. When he says, beginning in verse 4, love is patient and love is kind. He goes on to say that love uh, does not uh, envy, uh, love does not boast, and it is not uh, an avenger. Uh, love is not rude, and it does not insist upon its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rather rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all in all things. And because of that, he says, it'll cover a multitude of sins. I think that's an interesting concept that when you and I make mistakes, it is our love for one another that helps us to overlook that. It's marvelous in a husband-wife relationship. It's marvelous among brethren as well and in friendships. And then he says this, in the context of loving one another fervently, he says to show hospitality to one another without grumbling and do it in a serving way. We so much need each other. You hear what I'm saying? In the midst of suffering, when the world is being brutal to us, when, the, when life is being brutal to us, we so desperately need one another. And so show hospitality toward one another. That's inviting each other into our homes. And don't complain about the fact that I'm suggesting that you should be having me and other folks in your congregation here over to your home. That's literally what he says. Don't, don't, don't complain if the preacher tells you you're supposed to be having people at your house. Because you're supposed to be having people at your house. You know how I know that's so? Because the Bible says so. And how I know that you might very well gripe that I'm suggesting you should be having folks over to your house? Because Peter says, don't do it that way. He says, show hospitality and do it without grumbling about it. Rather, just do it. Because brethren, we so desperately need one another. Not just people that are going through really hard times. All of us need that. But especially those among us that are going through hard times. I'm thinking right now of of, uh, Billy and Nancy Griffin. And we can't have them over to our home right now. Quite literally, we probably can't even go to visit them because of the nature of her leukemia. She's not able to have a lot of visitors because you're a risk to her. Her immune system is shot to pieces, much like Brenda's was throughout the time that she was in the hospital. And so being around people was not a good thing. But brethren, you can't hurt her over the phone. If you and I were to be hospitable with her and with Billy over the phone to talk with them and communicate with them our love for them, as it is with every one of us, the rest of us as well, we can show hospitality and kindness and attention, fervent love toward one another, and the phone if nothing else. But indeed, invite one another into your homes. Your presence and my presence together is a way to help others overcome grief and suffering in difficult times. Thirdly, the third thing that Peter says is an imperative as we face the possibility of suffering in difficult times is learn to talk Bible. Learn to talk Bible. Well, you can't talk Bible unless you know Bible. But he quite literally says whoever speaks should do so as one who speaks the oracles of God in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And one's go-to thing might be to say, well, that's just talking about the preacher. that he's supposed to speak as it were the oracles of God. Well, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that preachers are to speak as the oracles of God. It just says if you're talking, you ought to be talking Bible. You ought to be talking to your friends, to your neighbors, to your spouse, to those in your family. Speak as though it were God's Word being spoken at that very moment. Talk Bible. Indeed, the pulpit and the classroom is true. But around your coffee table and in your living room or your kitchen are places where you should be talking Bible, as it were, the oracles of God. When you're having friends over for dinner, church members over for dinner, when you're having those moments of, 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 of quiet time with each other and with friends for dinner, speak as it were the oracles of God, that in everything God may be glorified, to praise Him. So if God is being glorified in my conversation, what's happening is, is you and I are talking about what great things God is doing. Can you not see how that would help us in the midst of suffering? That if in fact we're in hard times, if we're sitting around the table talking together about just how good God is, how wonderful the promises of God are, talking about what the Bible says about the joys of Christianity and the promises that we have and the blessedness of being His children. Learn to talk Bible, he says. Fourthly, 
He says, you and I need to be making certain that we're preparing for the judgment to come. Because God's going to bring all this suffering to an end. And those who are not right with Him will suffer the consequences of that. The Gentiles He's describing that mock us and make fun of us because we won't participate in their same lusts, passions, and sins. For that persecution that comes about because we are simply Christians in which they insult and ridicule us, know that a judgment is coming. But watch what Peter says about that judgment in verse 17. It's time for judgment to begin in the household of God. See, we've got it clear in our minds what's going to happen to the wicked who don't care about God and whose lives are ruled by sin and Satan. But the judgment's not going to begin with them. The judgment of God's going to begin in the household of God. And so he says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18 goes on to say, and if the good and the best of men are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Consider the ramifications of this. He's saying that the judgment of God is not just of the wicked, but you and I will give answer for the way we've lived. Have we paid attention to what I've been talking about for the last 15 minutes? About alcohol. About how we use our stuff for hospitality and for love for one another. And how we talk with one another and spend time in praising God to other people in talking Bible. Because the judgment of God is going to begin at the household of God. And he says, particularly upon those that have not obeyed the gospel of God, they will, quite simply, be lost. Now, this is not something we like to think about, but it's something that's very real. We don't have a problem with thinking about the fact that the wicked, the corrupt, those who would pervert the world and try and draw us into their perversion, we don't have any problem with the idea that God would judge them. But I'm telling you that even the good and the best of men are scarcely saved, this text says. Those that have not obeyed the gospel will be lost. That's what he clearly says. So I want you to be thinking now of those you know, friends, neighbors, those you count as close. If they've not obeyed the gospel, they're going to be lost. And the judgment begins with the good and the best of men. In 2 Corinthians or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul writes that Jesus is coming back, and when he does, he'll be inflicting judgment on those who do not know God, and on those, watch this, who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer punishment. Eternal destruction. Let's get our heads wrapped around this. Those that have not obeyed the gospel will suffer eternal destruction and punishment when Jesus comes back. That judgment day is coming, and it's specifically aimed at those that have not obeyed the gospel. The million dollar question is, how does one obey the gospel? Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said for us to go into all the world and and to preach that gospel to every creature. The story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was to be told to everyone that we know. All of our friends and loved ones, all the good people, all the decent people we know, share the gospel with them, He says, and those that believe it and are baptized will be saved. That's how one obeys the gospel. The conclusion then is, is those who have not obeyed the gospel, who have not believed and been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, will be lost. The good and the best of men are scarcely saved, but the ungodly, not at all. If your friends and your neighbors are good people, and I'm sure they are, if those you count close, those that you count as family, if they're good, then before God, share the gospel with them so they can obey it. Now if, on the other hand, they're useless wretches, Well, then just keep your mouth shut and don't say anything to them. They'll get what's coming to them. But beloved, if you think somebody you're close to is a good person and you want them to go to heaven, understand that being good ain't getting anybody to heaven. It is those who have obeyed the gospel who have become Christians. And those who have become Christians, he says, even of them the best are scarcely saved. Fifthly and finally, Entrust your souls to the Creator. I want to be among the saved. I want to be certain that I am among those who obeyed the gospel and therefore are going to heaven. And so he says in verse 19 of 1 Peter 4, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. Peter says entrust your souls. Why? Well, here's the reason why we need to entrust our souls to God is because there's going to be a fiery trial come upon you. Bad times are coming. I'm certain of this. 
Bad times are not necessarily financial disaster, but it can be. It's not wrecked health, though it can be. It's not necessarily the death of a loved one or the loss of a job, but it can be. But hard times of some sort are inevitably going to come to each one of us. In this room, there are many who are either married or used to be married, but now they're not because their spouse has died. You know that's going to happen to one out of two of every, every, every two in this room? If you are married, one out of the two of you is going to suffer the loss of a spouse. It's going to happen. One of you will outlive the other. The one who lives beyond will suffer the loss of a spouse. You and I are going to have hard times. Fiery trials that come upon us to test us. But don't think it's a strange thing that's happening to you. If there was anything I had trouble with in getting over with Brenda, it was why me and why now? Why her? In the midst of my ministry, when things were going so great, there were so many reasons for her to still be here. It just seemed so strange, so unbelievable. In fact, the primary symptom of grief on the loss of a spouse is denial. This can't be. This, there's just no way this is so. This can't happen to me. How many times have you heard people say that about any kind of suffering in their life? How could this happen to me? Some have lost children or grandchildren. Some have lost jobs, careers, homes, been burned to the ground. How can this happen to me? My friend, do not be surprised when fiery trials come upon you to test you as though something strange was happening. But rather, he says, rejoice. And so far as you share in the sufferings of Christ... And if you are insulted for the name of Christ, verse 14 goes on to say, you're blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name as you entrust yourself to Him. That's ultimately the thing here. Is that you and I need to put our trust in Him, entrust ourselves into His hands. He is the Creator. And beloved, if He brought you and I into this world, He can sure as the world take us on to the next one throughout all of eternity. So trust Him. Entrust yourselves. Entrust your souls to the faithful Creator who is able to take you on to eternal life. The epistle of 1 Peter was written with the idea of preparing Christians for hard times, knowing indeed that they would come and we should not think it strange when they do. And so Peter, Peter wrote the reasons why he wrote the book and what we're to do about it. That you and I should remain sober. Keep our thoughts and our minds and our eyes clearly focused on God's stuff. Be fervent in your love toward one another. And they should talk Bible. Learn Bible and speak Bible, both in your room, in your living room or in your kitchen or from the pulpit. Make certain we're talking Bible. Fourthly, prepare for the judgment of the wicked and help prepare those who are not yet ready to get ready. And then finally, entrust yourselves to God. If you have a need, you respond as we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. All we do is goodwill. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can lie, not a cloud in the sky, but His power quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey.
In the moments we're preparing to have a final prayer, we're going to have a final song. We're going to have a final prayer here in a second. Fellas, I want you to do me a favor. Take out your ink pen. Put your first name on the paper and check off the things that you would like to do in leadership and worship right now. Because in about 30 seconds, we're going to be having Joe and Paul pass through the audience and you're going to pass all of your papers. I guess they're on the end, so pass them that way. But you put your name on there, check off the things you'd like to do. We're going to collect those back up right now, if we may. Fellas, go ahead and pass through the auditorium. Do what? Oh, you can have mine. There you go. And just put your first name on there. If your name is Cliff, then everybody that's named Cliff will get to do what you put on there, okay? So. And whoever's supposed to lead the closing prayer walks slowly toward the front. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we again come to thee in prayer, thanking thee for this beautiful Lord's Day and all the many blessings. We're thankful, Father, for this wonderful country we live in and many freedoms we enjoy. Freedom of worship is one of these freedoms. Our Father, we're thankful for this congregation that meets here in Grosbeck. We're thankful for elders, the deacons, song leaders, ministers, and all those others uh, that help in this worship service this morning. We pray this worship service was conducted in a way of pleasing, acceptable unto thee. We're thankful, Father, for the young people that are here this morning. We're thankful for those responsible for having them here this morning. We're thankful for their graduation from one class to another one. Our Father, we're again come to thee in prayer, thanking thee for this avenue of prayer. We once again ask for some much needed and wanted rainfall for this area. <clears throat> we also I want to remember the sick of this congregation and be thy will. We pray that you'll restore them to their normal health. Once again, Father, we're thankful for your son and the sacrifice he made that each one of us might have a hope of eternal life. Once again, we ask that you forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.